Design optimization for safety. So as a follow-on to the, the previous presentation, foundational safety design principles. So there's a picture of a foundation of a house and a picture of a nice house. So we're gonna discuss what the foundational design principles are for safety. We're gonna look at design composition and how the, the, the composition of these design principles uh, need to come together as a unified whole to maximize safety and performance. <clears throat> and we'll look at, a, we're gonna look at two optimization projects, design optimization projects for safety, an existing uh, poorly performing urban multi-lane here in Ohio and a rural high-speed application, which was a peer review I did uh, at the request of uh, the Ohio DOT on, on a, as a sub-consultant to a, a project team on that one. So why is optimization important? So uh, we're, 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 as an industry, we're realizing that um, there's more going on here than meets the eye. So we're opening up a, a number of multi-lane roundabouts, um, and these are not in Ohio, any of these, and I've crossed out where they're located, but it's, it's an important point that there's a lot of projects across the country, multi-laners, that are having excessive amounts of property damage-only crashes. As an industry, we can we sort of are unsure why that's happening sometimes, and we, we may say, well, they're, they're, all, they're not injury crashes, so um, perhaps they're acceptable. But at some point, there's a, there's a number of PDOs, there's a number that gets too many to be really considered still safe and really acceptable. So as I look at, at projects, um, you know, then I look at projects that I've been involved with over the years and I say, well, wh what are the crash rates of these projects? I mean, this is all relatively new as an industry. We've only been putting roundabouts in it for, for say, you know, about 20 years. I've been at it for 20 years plus roundabouts. So these are some roundabouts that were open and, and these are having, you know, these are less than 20 and less than 10 uh, crashes. Mm -hmm. per, what, what is, what's the difference between the projects that are having uh, excessive amounts of PDOs and those that aren't? So that's an urban multi-lane example, and then we'll look at uh, the high-speed rural example and some of the important design principles, foundational design principles for those projects. And we're having anyone who, hey, who's on the roundabout listserv? Uh, anybody? So a, a, a handful of you. So there's a roundabout listserv for anyone who's interested. If you want to stay productive during the day, I'd advise not to be on it. <laughs> um, but, but as a consultant who I work day in and day out, Month in and month out, year in and year out. Now I'm in my 15th year with with MTJ Roundabout Engineering. I I track these things, and so there are fatalities occurring across the country at some of our rural roundabouts. So why is that occurring? And again, so well, you know, their blood alcohol level was too high, so they were impaired. Well, I'm not so sure that that's really um, acceptable response, in my opinion. So here's a project that that. I was involved with and it opened in probably 2005 or six and uh, it's performing well. So we'll look at that project as well. So what are these foundational safety principles? So first of all, like uh, if we're talking about multi-lane roundabouts or urban roundabouts with lots of traffic, we talk about conflict points. How many lanes do we need to provide acceptable operations for that project? And as an industry, you know, so, well, we didn't really know that if you put too many lanes in, more conflict points, that you may have, the you know, more chances of crashes. So we realized that conflict points are an important foundational principle. So you don't want to over-design the project. Speed control, that's something that's, that's paramount. We talk a lot about speed. It's often referred to as the fast path analysis. Perhaps we should call it the slow path analysis. But anyway, it's called the fast path analysis. And that's one that everyone's very familiar with. But some of these other ones are a little less uh, well known. For example, maximizing the angle between approach legs or alignments. Okay, so 90 degrees is best. We often hear that roundabouts are great for for uh, skewed intersections. Well, the actual research that's been done internationally suggests that you really want to square those up. That provides for a safer roundabout for a number of reasons. I'm not going to get into all the details. Um, entry angles and view angles are also important safety principles that need to be considered. And the, again, uh, with respect to um, particularly, particularly all roundabouts, particularly um, rural and high-speed roundabouts, the approach alignment and how we address driver expectancy issues on these high-speed applications is very important to avoid uh, bad crashes. So we'll look at each of these one by one. 
with a couple of slides. First, first one, operational analysis, minimizing your conflict points. This is a, a project I worked on a few years back, which I had a, a nice summary. Well, the initial concept had 98 conflict points. Okay, so uh, three lane entries, two lane entries, uh, et cetera, and so forth. As the first step in a peer review, we went through and, uh, and, you know, and part of this operational analysis and minimizing conflict points is trying to realize or understand what's an acceptable level of service on your 20 year design traffic, right? We don't design anything else for level service A, B, even like C for 20 years often, right? Uh, there are differences in growth areas with high growth, you know, potential from build to long range versus more uh, built up areas where you may not have much uh, growth in traffic. And so there are differences that you have to be cognizant of. So the, the operational analysis on this project, I use Rodell, we ended up with 48% less conflict points. So that's the first step to getting a safer set of roundabouts is conflict points. In addition, you can look at phased implementation to match your capacity to demand for the early years and allow for potential easy uh, you know, capacity expansion for long range traffic. Speed control, fast path analysis. So this is one that's very well known, very, you know, people, people don't miss this typically. Uh, here's an example of a project though that has a, a, a very, you know, excessive radius. Some folks say, well, uh, I don't, I don't really worry too much about that, but it's important. So we'll look at a project here that uh, combines both alignment angle between legs and speed control. So here's an example of a skewed angle, much greater than 90 degrees. And you get a very fast right turn speed in this case, which is, uh, can be particularly problematic for pedestrian crossings as your speeds are going to be higher, potentially. So here's an example of how we would use the design flexibility with roundabout design. We, we've heard a lot about design flexibility, but we still have to adhere to the design principles for safety. And so we use that flexibility to resolve the issue in design. So it's a smaller ICD. The ICD is an outcome. It's not something you start with and stick with. It's an outcome that you use and modify it bigger, smaller, and so you want to use that as a principle and not a standard as far as your sizes. So that we're able to square up that, that angle and have a slower speed path and improved pedestrian safety. Entry angle and view angle. These are much less well known. And, you know, as you read the, the guidance that's out there in, in, our, in our NCRHP 672, the Federal Highway Roundabout Guide and, and other guidance, it's difficult. It doesn't jump out at you and tell you which one is most important. Okay. Here's an example of, again, of a skewed intersection, which has a uh, much greater than 90 degree skew. Also has speed control issues associated with it for both the through movement and the right turn pass. And so as we, we begin to optimize this design for safety, we look to square up that, that intersection and look what happens. So we square it up. It's not perfectly 90, but it's a lot better than it was. There's lots of constraints here that we're balancing. And our, our, our entry angle, referred to as fee angle now, meets the standard and principle. And our view angle to the left is met as well. In addition, our speed control is much better, which will improve both vehicular to vehicular as well as uh, improve the environment for pedestrians and all users, bicycles as well. So here's the uh, uh, first optimization example, case study. This is, this is in uh, Ohio. Um, project I was asked to be involved with. Uh, we look at the, the original design. It has a high view angle. Okay, it's, it's 17 to 20 degrees. We like it to be closer to 10 to 12 degrees. Um, and when these, when these entries are flatter, it looks more like a merge condition. And you get people, people have less yielding behavior and they have more, you know, merging behavior. Merging behavior. I was going to say merging behavior, behavior, so that doesn't work. Um, prior to confusion, who, who yields to whom is, is also confused with the flatter angles. So it's about 17 degrees in the southbound direction, about 20, particularly so it's, it's measured in the outside lane looking back to the left, um, 17 degrees off of 90. In addition, the fee angle, which is something that's 
uh, confusing. Uh, it's not really, uh, it's mentioned in our NCHP 672 guide. It's, it's men mentioned more strongly in other design guidance that's out there. And that comes from the UK. But so meeting the fee angle and the view angle uh, is important. So in this particular project, we have circuitry widths that are, that are equal distance. Okay? So one thing that we can do, and here's a project that I, we did this to, as, as we are going to propose here in this project, is we take that inside lane on the circuit roadway and make it 10 to 12 feet. Okay? Well, what that does, and then the outside lane becomes much wider. It improves a lot of things. Okay? Well, just so we're not changing any curbs with this project, all we're doing is we, we modified this, the uh, circuitry lane line placement and the yield line placement slightly, and we're able to affect the view angle pretty substantially. Okay? Signing and marking. There's a tendency and a, and a, an easy to over-sign multi-lane roundabouts in urban conditions. We end up with uh, you know, information overload, and uh, that can be problematic. We know that from all our industry, you know, but we, we end up with a lot of signing typically at urban multi-lane roundabouts. Here is the Ohio project uh, that started off, it looked like this on the approach, lots of information going on in a short period of time. And we proposed changing that to try to clarify and simplify the decision making. And that's uh, what it looks like today. We changed the fish hook style uh, arrows to standard arrows. We used the R16 style pedestrian signage, which is based on some research for that signage, to try to provide height variation uh, to sign in to improve target value for all signing at this project. And use conventions that drivers are used to as opposed to uh, drivers that uh, conventions that drivers aren't used to. In addition, we looked, we, the operational analysis showed that we didn't need all that lanage. So we could reduce the conflict points as well. So we op opened it back up as a two by one roundabout, uh, making that outside turn lane a right turn lane, making some curb line modifications. And that will last most of the design year of this project based on the, the traffic projections. But, but we also have a phased, you know, you can then bring that back to the, the two lane roundabout when capacity is necessary. So when we look at uh, more, we're going to switch gears here to more of the transitional and high-speed applications uh, and how important driver expectancy is. Okay? We know that as an industry, our roadway design standards are predicated on that, our highway design standards for, for speeds and curves and sight distances, etc. But with roundabouts, we uh, sometimes uh, ignore those things. So here's a project that has the placement is out of sight. So you have a rural highway uh, that people are driving miles and miles and miles without any interruption and we suddenly put in a roundabout that's basically out of sight on that approach. Now if you're local and you're used to this it's probably not a problem but what if you're not from the area? What if you're visiting friends or family you haven't been there in five years so all of a sudden there's something there? So that could be challenging. So here's a revised placement and design, associated design. Uh, that puts the, the roundabout in the driver's line of sight on the approach, both from a distance and as you get closer. So this therefore adheres to the driver expectancy principles, it provides a terminal vista, and you're going to have a much less chance of someone missing that project, like occurred at this project that recently was on the roundabout listserv. So you can see on this approach, the roundabout is off, offset. Perhaps there was constraints on that north side that they were trying to avoid. Um, and they put it there. But someone, someone missed it and they ran into some rocks in the central island. That is, that is you know, another issue we're going to talk about in a, in a moment. But um, you really want that roundabout in the line of sight. And there's other mitigations that, that you can do here when it's not right in the line of sight as well, which we'll talk about some more. So landscaping of the central island on these high speed roads, you know, you don't want fixed objects in this. You want a mounted, uh, you want to use uh, clear zone type vegetation appropriate for your area. Um, and these uh, are based on, you know, science and principles in, in, in across 
really international as well as in the US, North America. Here's a high speed example. Uh, you're coming off of um, uh, Highway 151 there, off to the, to the right side of your screen, and you split off onto US Highway 18. So you're coming off a 65 mile per hour facility onto a 55 divided, uh, divided uh, two lane road that was pre roundabout, a size three stop con control that had lots of crashes, bad crashes. And uh, you can see some of the you know, slight alignment changes that we made to square up the intersection, uh, which then allows for sight line, uh, ability to provide you know, good sight line on both the approach, uh, as well as as you get near the intersection for good target value and conspicuity as you approach that roundabout. In addition, it's heavily landscaped. So when, when, when I was involved in this project, when I was with, with WISDOT, it was, well, we need to change the character of this. They were going to put in an interchange here to resolve the bad crashes, but the, the town didn't want to interchange, interchange, you know, and there was environmental issues and lots of issues with an interchange. It certainly would have solved the crash problem, but it was really expensive and impactive. But so we talked about changing the character on the approach. And I, I've had, had colleagues come up to me after it was built. Well, what's the deal with all the landscaping? We don't usually do landscaping. You know, we're the, we're the DOT. We don't want landscape. We don't want maintenance. But if you go back in our industry, you know, there's a lot of discussion early on about changing the character and using landscaping to change that character. Okay, so this is what we did on the approach. Particularly, you can see it there up to the, on the north side or at the top of the picture. Appropriately, uh, uh, size caliper trees based on clear zone and, and breakaway considerations in both directions. There's also um, advanced intersection lighting. We mentioned the landscaping, the channelization, the entry angle, speed control, all those are also met as well. So here's a uh, <clears throat> the example number two of a, uh, oh, this is the, the Stark County, uh, S, S State Route 619 McCallum Avenue, safety improvement um, project. And here's the location of it. Off to the left there is Akron, north, uh, and then, uh, I'm not sure what's to the right, can't see it anymore. Uh, but you can see the, the yellow dot there, it's, it's, out, it's out there in the, out in the, in the, in a rural area. You can see the curvature of the roads and the sort of the context, there's some driveways, the residential. And as you look at these photos, it, it's currently a, a free flow condition. It's, you know, it's pretty wide open, but there's curves. The roundabout is, is on a curve and on a skewed intersection. So there's some challenges here with this application of a roundabout. Again, free flow, uh, state routes uh, 619, and we're going to put in a roundabout. Okay, so the, the original design came in and it looks, looked like this. And so we'll just step through some of the design principles for safety that I find in the review. So you can see that the angles are skewed. Um, you can see there's, the, you know, the roundabout is out of sight. There's some issues with perhaps some right turn speed control. Not a big issue here. There's not, there's no pedestrians. Um, but driver expectancy is a big one um, on this project. In addition, you know, we have to maintain, uh, the, the, the design has long splitter islands on the main line, which is good. That helps mitigate the, 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 the application. Uh, but they have also long splitter islands on the side street, McCallum, which precludes driveway access and may make more impacts. And those, may not be necessary. The driver expectation north-south is a stop sign. Now has been for a long time. In addition, it's, it's a square squared up. Also, it's got pretty tight curves on these approaches, a little too tight. You know, the joke is the milk truck will come through here and you have butter by the time it gets to the roundabout. So you need, you need you know, appropriate curves for the speeds and the context of the project. You can do that in a slower speed environment, but on a high speed, it you may end up with some loss of control crashes that would be bad. There's other design details, you know, circuitry widths are, are not conforming to what we'd like to see. Uh, and so there's some overall uh, compositional issues with the geometrics of the roundabouts. So what we want to do is uh, address context and driver expectancy, visual conspicuity, um, maintain the longer mainline splitter islands, but we'll, we'll want to mitigate the skew and the curve, provide early advance indications of the changing conditions up ahead. We probably can shorten up those side street splitter islands to both reduce costs and impacts, but maybe more importantly to uh, maintain access for the, the uh, residents and that are 
currently there. So our peer, the, the optimization process restores a safety uh, for both the context, uh, driver expect, expectancy issues, as well as the specific geometrics of the roundabout. And that's what it looks like after it's been redesigned. You might notice it's non-circular. Uh, I haven't listed the, the, the exact ICD because I'm trying to de-emphasize the specific size of the roundabout and emphasize you use that, that shape and size and placement, that flexibility to meet these design principles. There's an overlay of the original with the uh, redesigned, optimized design. And you can see we, we wanted to maintain similar impacts in terms of right away, et cetera, and costs as far as limits and those sorts of things, which we, we were able to accommodate. So now we have much less curvature on both approaches. We have a squared up leg that was previously skewed. Our right turns are slower. We have appropriate circuitry widths now at about 20 feet. We maintain the longer splitter islands along the main line high speed route. We shorten the splitter islands for the side street that was previously stop control or currently stop control. Um, and it's, so it's principle, it's, print, it's guided by principles. It's not necessarily guided by criteria. We also meet all the safety performance design checks for trucks, speed control, et cetera, sight distance, those things that are also very important. And there's a look at the, at the final design completed by the, the prime consult that I'm working through on this project. Oh no, that was a, it's a DOT led design project, excuse me. So I believe this is my summary slide. Um, Runabout performance is, is, is less about the individual design components. It's too big, it's too small, and it's more about the composition of, of multiple design elements okay, that start with and are informed by these foundational design principles for safety. The operational analysis, the roadway, the context in which you're applying this project is very important, as well as both roundabout specific and overall roadway geometrics and design. And if I do have one additional slide that shows a video that's maybe a minute long, if that, if I have time. Um, hopefully it's in here. Okay, well, here's, a, here's an urban multi-lane roundabout, a two-by-two two roundabout that um, you'll see here in a moment. Well, there's some, there's some kids on bikes. If you can see them where that arrow is, there's about five of them. There's a kid on it. You can't see it, but one is on a handlebar. One's on a skateboard. Okay, this is a, a community outside of Madison, Wisconsin, a suburb of, of Madison, if you will. They're going to the, the, the quickie stop to, to get a Slurpee, uh, my guess. But, um, you know, we sent a drone up just to try to capture some video, talk a lot about, you know, safety and, and, and non-motorized users. And um, this roundabout adheres to the safety design principles, right? So speed control, everything is dialed in and met. It is slightly non-circular, but it works well. It works well for all modes as well. So that's it. Thank you.